Uh, you can't find it. I think it'll be better. Okay, it doesn't look like my camera's working for some reason. Uh, you just have quizzes? Like, Are you also learning about the transcription translation? Yes. Like okay, so let's see if we can get started here. My camera doesn't seem to be working. It's not, not coming up here. Let me do the share and see, see if people on the screen can see the share. Okay, so Patrick, my rock, can you see this PowerPoint? Yes, I'm not sure if you're able to hear me, but we can see it. Yeah, I can hear you good. How's my voice? Can you hear me okay? We can hear you great, thank you. And we can also see you now. Oh, really? How's my hair looking? <laughs> <laughs> Look, looks great. That which is left. Okay, so today we're going to start in on chapter 10. Chapter 10 is all about, the, mostly about the cell cycle. My is a little, a little quick and easy to go through, um, but we're going to do that. Um, I looked at the exam, it looked like most people did pretty well on the multiple choice. I'm going to grade the, the, um, uh, the written answers this afternoon, so hopefully we'll have enough done this afternoon for these to be good results. So life is good. Things keep moving. All right, so the cell cycle, yay. Kind of, you can kind of look at it from a bio 101 perspective, but we're, we're going to get a lot more detail here. Hopefully. So cell cycle is basically broke up into two phases, interphase and mitosis. Um, and that goes all the way back to the light microscope when all you could see was what was going on. Like nothing was happening until the cell divided. And then it went back to nothing happening. Of course, there's a lot of stuff going on in the cell. But anyway, after mitosis is G1, um, and you've got a big restriction point here between G1 and synthesis. So this is a really difficult passage to get through. It's pretty complicated how it happens. We'll talk about that in the next class. But once you get through that, the cell is pretty much committed to finish the cell cycle. Because at this point, you're going to duplicate your, your chromosomes <clears throat> and the cell can't survive with all those chromosomes. So it has to go ahead and finish the, the cell cycle at that point. So in S phase, then we're doing replication and duplicating the genome. And then G2, <clears throat> the G means gap, because it's a gap between. But I like to think of it as growth too, because really what the cell's doing here is getting a little bit bigger, making more stuff. So when it divides in half, it has enough stuff that both cells are going to be able to survive. And also it's checking to make sure that the genome was replicated correctly and there aren't a lot of mistakes and stuff. So it's making sure the cell's ready. So we've got another checkpoint here, G2M, that we'll talk about today. 
then you've got mitosis. And in the center of mitosis, we've got another, um, another checkpoint that we'll talk about, the metaphase anaphase checkpoint. So here in mitosis, basically you're dividing the chromosomes. And then at the end of mitosis, you've got cytokinesis to divide the cell. And now you've got two smaller cells, so you've got growth up to a normal size. And you'll see as the cell goes through, when it goes into mitosis, it rounds up and it goes through the whole chromosome separation. And then once it hits G1, it flattens out again and it um, becomes more like an adult cell. So <clears throat> that's your cell cycle. And the first thing to talk about then is mitosis. I, I don't like to spend too much time on mitosis, especially the phases of mitosis, because again, it's kind of bio 101 stuff. But let's take a look at it. Mainly what I focus on here is cytoskeleton. We talked in chapter three about the cytoskeleton, uh, motor, motor maps and stuff like that. And so we'll see how they come into play here in mitosis. So um, prophase, a lot, of, a lot of textbooks and things will separate into two parts, early prophase and late prophase or prophase and prometaphase, doesn't really matter. Um, bottom line is here in prophase, you've got the nuclear membrane disintegrating. We have to get the membrane out of the way to, to separate the chromosomes. That's the first one thing that happens. Another thing is the asters. Now, the, this is the uh, uh, MTOC, my, microtubule organizing center or centrosome. During G2, it duplicates, so you end up with two. And right after duplication, they're next to each other. So in early prophase, they start to separate, segregate to, pole, to the poles of the cell. <clears throat> and the third thing that starts to happen here is the chromosomes are going to start condensing. Um, so in interphase, you can't see chromosomes at all. They're just totally uh, diffuse because they're so small. But then they start condensing. You can see them as, as kind of small threads. And then late prophase, all these things finished. The nuclear membrane is totally gone. Your asters are at the poles and your microtubules of the um, mitotic spindle are going throughout the whole cell here. And they're attaching to the center of the chromosomes and that is called the kinetochore. Kinetochore is the um, proteins that are attached to the centromere of the sister chromatids. So we'll talk more in depth about that in a minute. And then we get to the metaphase, which is when the sister chromatids line up at the metaphase plate. And it's kind of interesting if you see this kind of in an accelerated um, uh, time lapse photography of mitosis. You can see at the late prophase stage, the chromosome is kind of being dragged in both directions. You can see it jerking back and forth until it ends up right in the center here. And that's your my and the cell is going to pause at this point. Now it's going to pause to make sure that all the chromosomes or all the sister chromatids are attached to the mitotic spindle. Because if they're not, you know, two sister chromatids go in one direction and nothing in the other, and then both cells die. So it's really important that they're lined up properly here. And so it pauses there to check to make sure it's okay. And once it does, the sister chromatids separate and go to the opposite poles. And here in anaphase, you've got really two things going on. Sometimes they talk, sometimes they talk about anaphase A and anaphase B. Anaphase A is when the sister chromatids first separate and start heading away. And then anaphase B is when the cell starts to elongate, which is another important part of the mitosis. Um, question. Um, what happens to the uh, nuclear envelope? Does it just get dissolved? Yes, good question. So I'll talk about this later today, but we might as well talk about it now. You know, a plasma membrane, a lipid bilayer doesn't really want to be in one of these extended forms like the plasma membrane, all the internal membranes. It's not energetically favorable. You need proteins there to keep it in that form. So what's going on with the nuclear membrane is on the inside, you've got these intermediary proteins called nuclear lamina. And the nuclear lamina are all polymerized and they're holding that membrane in place. Um, when prophase activates, um, they will be phosphorylated, depolymerized, and the membrane just 
collapses into little, uh, uh, I mean, my cells, not my cells, uh, liposomes, okay? Really small, and they still have proteins attached to them, but they're really small, you can't see them in the light microscope. And then at the end of prophase, they'll repolymerize. So basically it's all still there. It's just kind of too small to see in a light microscope. Okay, so anaphase, we've separated the sister chromatids and we're stretching the cell. And then telophase. I always like to say telophase is like the opposite of prophase. Everything that happened in prophase unhappens in telophase. So the chromatids are now going to uh, um, decondense and start becoming, go back to that interphase uh, structure. Your nuclear membrane starts to reform and this, the uh, mitotic spindle depolymerizes and then the interphase uh, uh, microtubules start to reform. And so basically my, this is the end of mitosis when you've got your nucleus separated into two nuclei and then the cleavage furrow starts to form. And the cleavage furrow then is caused by um, ba -ba -bum, actin and myosin. Looks very similar to, a, to the uh, structure you see in skeletal muscle, right? We've got um, contractile apparatus here, but it's going around it like a belt. And the belt gets shorter and shorter and shorter and thinner and thinner until the whole thing separates into two cells. So that's our cytokinesis. I went through that kind of quick. I mean, I think everyone knows the phases of mitosis at this point. Um, uh, I haven't really added a whole lot here. So the next part is like <clears throat> what all these movements are and why, why they're ha how they're happening and stuff. So we've got three different kinds of microtubules. We've got astral microtubules, and they go between the asters and the cell cortex. And then we've got polar microtubules that are going to overlap from either side, and then kinetochore microtubules that attach to the kinetochore. So so you've got motors at all of these positions. So in terms of the asters, if we back up and think about early prophase, the asters are both next to each other, right? They were just duplicated. One was just duplicated, now you've got two, and they're next to each other. They send microtubules out and attach to the cortex over here. And you've got a motor there that's going to pull on that microtubule, depolymerize it as it gets closer, and pull the, that aster from the center out to the poles. So that's one of the things the astral microtubules do. They also kind of anchor this aster here so any force put on the microtubules is not going, I mean, on the chromosomes, it's not going to pull the aster towards itself, but it's going to be pulled towards the aster. Um, so these astral microtubules then are anchoring the asters to the cortex of the cell. Then we've got our polar microtubules. And remember, this, this motor is going from the minus to the plus end. So this is a Guinean motor and going towards the minus end. In your polar microtubules, we're overlapping from either side, and you've got a motor between them. And this motor is walking from the minus to the plus end, so it's a kinesin motor. And as it walks in that direction, the microtubule is polymerizing, getting longer. And so this action is pushing those poles apart and stretching the cell. So the polar microtubules are causing the cell to stretch. And finally, <clears throat> your kinetochore microtubules then attach to this complicated protein structure here on the centromere, um, which is the kinetochore. And you've got a um, dynean motor here pulling the um, chromosome towards the aster. And you also have a kinesin over here at the uh, centrosome itself pulling the microtubule towards itself. So it's really being pulled at both ends. The microtubule is being pulled in by the aster and the chromosome is crawling down the microtubule as it goes there, as it goes towards the aster. And we're depolymerizing at both ends as we go. Um, so here's another way of looking at it. Here's your, your polar microtubules overlapping. And as they get longer, they push the sides apart 
can stretch that cell. <clears throat> and that's your anaphase B when the cell is really elongated. Now, kinetochores. So here's some cool pictures of kinetochores. Um, I love these electron micrographic pictures, but I have a hard time seeing anything in them, really. I mean, there's your kinetochore there, the microtubules coming away from it. I'm a big fan of the, uh, of the, of the drawings, as you know. <laughs> um, so anyway, can, in the center here, between the two sister chromatids, there's a whole lot of um, tandemly repeating DNA, which means something uh, like, I don't know how many base pairs this is. Usually it's about eight or 10 base pairs over and over and over and over and over, or like hundreds of, of base pairs. And the reason why that's important is you've got two sister chromatids here with identical tandem repeats in the middle, and that helps to keep the sister chromatids together. They'll kind of hybridize with each other crossing over and hanging on to each other. So that's part of what keeps, keeps the sister chromatids together. But also you've got proteins all around the center. One of the proteins here in the center is called cohesin. And cohesin is, is helping to hold those together because once the microtubules attach, they start pulling on that, um, on that kinetochore <clears throat> and you've got a lot of pressure there. And you really don't want this to happen until all the chromosomes are attached to the to the are, are attached to the kinetochore um, microtubules and lined up at the metaphase plate. So there's a lot of pulling going on here, but there are proteins that are called cohesins that are holding it together and uh, waiting for the signal to let go. Going fast today. Am I going too fast? I'm just so excited to be here. I'm going too fast. Okay. So anyway, you can imagine. Um, as the, when the cell is in prophase, the microtubules are like polymerizing out and coming back and out and back. It's kind of got that dynamic instability thing going until the microtubule hits the, the um, kinetochore and then it gets grabbed by these connecting proteins and that holds on to it. So during prophase, you've got a lot of uh, dynamic instability until they get stabilized by grabbing the kinetochore or the kinetic or grabbing it. <clears throat> so this, this drawing, unfortunately, doesn't show you any, uh, any of the other proteins involved, but this is just showing what grabs onto the microtubule there. So we've got our question. How does the microtubule kind of target the kinetic core? Like, how does it know it's exactly going to hit it? I, I don't know, but I can make something up for you. Sure. I think what's going on is you've got, um, your kinetochore is an attachment point. The microtubules growing out, missing it, coming back, growing out, missing it, till eventually it hits it, gets grabbed, and then it gets stabilized. Because there is a lot of that stuff going on, the back and forth. Okay. But the kinetochore is not like releasing any signals. This isn't analogous to like. Uh, That's a good question. I don't know. It's possible. It is possible. Yeah, I don't know. Any other questions back there? Is there a cleavage that happens within the sister chromatid, or is it just the sheer force of the DNA? We'll get to that. We'll get. There's not going to be a cleavage of the DNA, but the, the DNA will let go. But there's a cleavage of the cohesins, right? And that's what allows it to let go. So that's the next thing we're going to talk about. That. Well, no, a couple couple of things from now. And we'll talk about that. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. All right, so I always go through that part fast because it seems simple to me. Um, this next part is kind of complicated. <laughs> so we'll focus on this a little more. So here's your cell cycle again. <clears throat> and we've got three main checkpoints. This checkpoint, the G2 to M, and this one here, the restriction point to go into S. Those two checkpoints are very similar. They're done by similar mechanisms. And this one is very different. The M to metaphase to anaphase is very different. So this G2 to M transition is influenced by cell size. Cell has to be big enough to make it through mitosis. And it's also checking for DNA damage and that the DNA is totally replicated. So after synthesis happens in S phase, um, the cell is ensuring that the two genomes that were made are complete 
before it goes through. Um, this uh, M to A transition here, making sure that all the chromis, sister chromatids are attached to the mitotic spindle. Otherwise, like I said, you end up with aneuploidy and both cells end up dying. And this one down here, which we'll talk about Thursday, <clears throat> is influenced by growth factors. So also nutrient cell size and DNA damage. So it has to make sure that the cell is, is healthy and has everything it needs to, to continue on in the cell cycle. But more importantly, growth factors. Um, most cells in your body are not dividing and will never divide, right? Nerve cells, famously, when they die, they're dead. Um, not entirely true. I think there's some new evidence saying they can regenerate, but we typically assume they're not going to regenerate. Um, heart cells, muscle cells, things like that. Other cells like your liver cell are typically not dividing, but they can be induced to divide. Um, fibroblasts can be induced to divide. And that's all about growth factor signals. So in the last chapter, we talked about growth factors, activating signal transduction pathways, and they all ended up in the nucleus. Well, you're gonna turn on things here in the nucleus that are gonna cause the cell to go into the cell cycle. And we're gonna see that connection in this chapter. How is it that growth factors cause the cell to go into, growth, into the um, cell cycle? <clears throat> but we're gonna start out with a little bit of history, which kind of focuses on this um, G2 to M transition. This was the first one that was kind of um, understood. So how do you figure this out? What's making cells go through this process? Well, the original experiments, what they did was they would take a cell that was in S phase and a cell that was in G1 and fuse them together. And what they found was when they did that, the S phase cell made the G1 cell go into, um, into S phase. So you can see there's something in the cytoplasm here that is forcing the second cell to go forward in the cell cycle. And here too, you've got a cell in mitosis in a cell in G1. Now a cell in G1 is not ready to divide, right? It hasn't even divided, hasn't even uh, duplicated its genome. But when you fuse the two together, they, the first one makes the second one go into mitosis. So there's something again in the cytoplasm that's, that's activating this transition. And um, here's an experiment with oocytes. So oocytes are premature egg cells and pretty much they've gone through meiosis one and duplicated, and then one of the cells dies as a polar body. And that second one kind of pauses there, doesn't, doesn't finish mitosis two, it just kind of gets frozen there at that point. And so what they did here was they trying to figure out what makes a cell go from G2 into mitosis or meiosis to finish that second, um, that second phase of meiosis. So they take a cell, <clears throat> they take an oocyte and they activate it, they make it go into meiosis and they suck out some of the cytoplasm and inject it into this immature cell and boom, it goes into meiosis. So there's something in the cytoplasm that activates that cell and they're gonna call, call and this causes the maturation of that egg cell. So we're gonna call this maturation prom promoting factor. And so it's just kind of a generic name to say, this is what the cell, what makes the cell activate and go into, into my uh, maturation. <clears throat> so what do you do? You then take that cytoplasm, run it out on SDS page, you find out what proteins are there, you isolate the proteins, you see which proteins are gonna cause the cell to go into meiosis. And they find that there are two proteins that are necessary. A lot of other things going on as well but two specific proteins are gonna be necessary. Your cyclins and your cyclin dependent kinases, cyclins and CDKs. So cyclins are the regulatory molecule, CDKs are the kinases, these are the ones. So then when the cyclin binds the CDK, it gets activated. And then the CDK then activates target proteins and that causes the changes we see in the cell at the transition. So, and then after you go through that transition, the cyclin gets degraded. So that's kind of interesting too. The, degrade, the degrading part keeps you going forward in the cell cycle. So if you look back at these experiments, you're always going forward in the cell cycle, never backwards. 
So it's it's a it's a clock. It only goes in one direction. So we've got these two different proteins that are going to be important: cyclins and CDKs. And cyclins are called cyclin because if you look at their concentration throughout the cell cycle, it goes up and down, and up and down, and up and down. So they're cyclin. As if if you're talking about a cell that's always in the cell cycle, like a stem cell, you can see the cyclins going up and down and up and down. Okay, so we've got really four CDKs that we're most interested in. These are the most important ones. These CDKs, again, are going to phosphorylate targets and cause, cause the changes that we see in the cell. And they typically, again, if you're talking about like a, a stem cell that's always in the cell cycle, <clears throat> those CDKs are going to be there all the time. They're not always going to be active, but they're always going to be there. And the ones that are important to us are, this could be a little confusing, CDK1, which is also called CDC2. So CDC2 was one of the first, was the first uh, CDK to be found. And the, the whole um, nomenclature of CDC uh, has to do with the history of how these proteins were found. You know, they took cells like this that were in mitosis, ran the proteins out on a gel. Here's uh, cyclin, cell division cycle one, cell division cycle two, three, four, five, all the proteins. So if you remember back to um, chapter three, we talked about CDC42. Remember that G protein uh, involved in cell crawling? A lot of times when you activate a cell to divide, you also activate it to move. So that gets activated during the cell cycle. So anything that's in CDC, it's called that because it was one of the early proteins um, isolated that are part of the cycle. Um, so anyway, CDC2, also known as CDK1, is involved in that G2 to M transition. CDK2 um, is going to be the passage through R. CDKs four and six get you up to R. So after G1, we'll see shortly that cycle in D and CDKs four and six will get us up to that restriction <coughs> and stop there. And then CDK2 and cycle in E will get us through the restriction point. And that's for Thursday. So I'm always stealing my own thunder here. I like to keep it as a surprise, but that's going to happen on Thursday. Anyway. So cyclins then are your regulatory proteins. They're going to bind to the CDKs and activate them. Uh, concentration is controlled by ubiquitulation and degradation for all of them except for cyclin D. So all the other ones are, are um, you can kind of think of them as being synthesized on a regular basis through the cell cycle and then degraded to turn them off. Okay, and their concentrations rise and fall. So cyclin D, this is something you should know. Cyclin D is going to activate CDKs four and six. Cyclin E activates two. Uh, cyclin A also activates two at a different part of the cell cycle. And it can jump off CDK2, jump onto CDC2. Um, uh, and throughout the cell cycle. And then cyclin B is the one that we'll mainly talk about today. Cyclin B activates CDC2 and causes that transition to, into G1. Um, I mean, into mitosis. So um, uh, what did I want to say about this? OK, so later on Thursday, we'll look at the kind of, it's almost like a complicated dance that goes on between the cyclones and CDKs, because um, the cyclin D and CDK four and six, that's pretty, pretty standard. Cyclin E, CDK2 will get you into S phase, but in the middle of S phase, cyclin E gets degraded and cyclin A jumps onto CDK2. You get most of the way through S2, you get into G1. No, I think most of the way through S, S phase and cyclin A then jumps off CDK2, jumps on CD, CDC2, gets you to G, G2, and then cycle A gets degraded and cycle, it's complicated, but we'll get there. Okay, but what we wanna focus on today is this, the cycle B CDC2 connection. 
Okay, so back to the general stuff. <clears throat> Cyclones activate the decays. They're going to slowly build up until they reach some kind of threshold. And we'll talk about what makes that threshold. Uh, CD1, when cyclone B builds up, CDK1 becomes active. And now we call it MPF. Um, remember, before that was a generic term for the protein that gets you through. Now we know it's cyclone B, CDK1. CD, MPF activity rises really sharply, so the cell rapidly goes into mitosis. And then after you get into mitosis, cyclone B gets degraded, and that shuts off MPF. So cyclone B, B, B builds up slowly until it reaches a threshold. Then that activates CDK1, MPF activates really quickly, and the cell goes into mitosis. And really quickly after it goes into mitosis, it shuts off. Okay, so the question then, and this is what complicates the, the, the transition a little bit, is why does it rise so sharply? If cyclin B is building up slowly, why does MPF activate very quickly? So here you look at cyclin B concentration. Here we are in the middle of mitosis, it drops down, and now it's slowly building up, slowly building up, slowly building up, and then suddenly MPF turns on, and MPF turns on really quickly. And then at the peak of MPF, boom, cyclin B drops off. So the question we want to answer then is why is that this is building up slowly, but then it activates really quickly? I have a quick question. Yep. Um, in the previous slide, so is it cyclin B activating CDKs or just all cyclins activating CDKs? Uh, I guess G2 checkpoint cyclin B. I'll, I'll repost this to uh, Brightspace so correct all my mistakes. It's important to be able to correct. Okay. So anyway, what's with this threshold thing? Whenever you see a threshold, it's oftentimes it's it's um, a positive feedback loop. Like we see in the action potential, right? You get a little depolarization. Some sodium channels open, which depolarizes the cell more, which opens more sodium channels, which depolarizes more until all the channels open. It's a positive feedback loop. Similar things happening here. My, my favorite positive feedback loop um, is oxytocin during uh, birth, right? You get stretch on the uterus, and that stretch causes the release of oxytocin, which causes contraction of the uterus, increasing stretch, causing an increase in oxytocin release, and just builds on itself until the contraction is strong enough to, to expel the alien invader. Okay, so anyway, here we are. This is the beginning of the cycle, right? Cyclin B is building up. As cyclin B builds up, it binds to C to C2, and it makes an inactive complex, okay? It's not active yet. The next thing that happens is we're going to take this inactive complex and inactivate it. There are some kinases, and one of them is called a WE. Um, WE puts two phosphates on this, and that's going to make it inactive. Of course, it's already inactive, but now it's super special, doubly inactive. Then we get another kinase coming in, and it's going to phosphorylate it, and that's an activating phosphorylation. But you still have these inactivating phosphorylations here. So now we've got a whole lot of this inactive MPF building up with these inactivating phos phosphorylations on it. And then the next step becomes the rate determining step in the positive feedback mechanism. There's a phosphatase called CDC25C. So this phosphatase is going to take those two inactivating phosphates off. And when they do, it becomes active. It's now MPF. Now what makes this a positive feedback mechanism 
is this NPF is going to come back and phosphorylate CDC25, and that stimulates it. So now CDC25 is going faster. And so you get more NPF activated, which activates more CDC25, which activates more NPF. There's your positive feedback loop. And so you go from this low activity of NPF to really high activity of NPF all of a sudden. Okay, kind of a burst of activity there. Question. So dephosphorylation activates it? Right. But it won't be activated unless it's been previously phosphorylated with the activated kinase. How is it different than the kinase that's regularly used? Right. So there are kinases, there are um, phosphorylation sites in different places of the protein. So first you phosphorylate those inactivating ones to keep it inactive. Then you put the activating phosphate on there and now it's primed. And then you take the two inactivating ones off and boom, it's ready. Okay, so there is one active region and two inactive regions. So two inactive regions needs to be phosphorylated for the active region to take. Right, and that's why it's a phosphatase that actually activates it. Okay. Okay. All right. Any questions? It's not a neat mechanism. It gives you a nice sharp threshold there because you want you don't want the cell to start going into mitosis when it's still in S phase or early G two. You want it to build up. I always think it's like a um, one of those uh, guns with the darts with the sticker suckers on the end. You're pushing that dart into the gun until it clicks and you pull the trigger and it shoots. You know? It's kind of building up and building up and then it shoots. Okay. And then at the peak here, you get ubiquitilation of cyclin B and degradation. And that's why NPF drops off real quick and cyclin B drops off real quick because of the ubiquitilation. Now we've been talking about ubiquitilation, I think since day one, and I keep saying, we're gonna talk about that someday. Um, so that day has come. So ubiquitilation, ubiquitin is a small protein. It's about 76 amino acids, and it's got seven lysines in it. Lysine is important because um, ubiquitin gets added to lysine residues. So we've got three enzymes that are important for ubiquitilation. You've got E1, E2, and E3. E1 is going to pick up free ubiquitin and grab onto it. And it's then going to pass that ubiquitin to E2. E2 then becomes almost like a cofactor on E3. It sits there with its ubiquitin ready to add. So E3 then is the main ligase then that's gonna put ubiquitin on some substrate. So the E3 ligase then puts ubiquitin on a lysine of the substrate, and then another E2 will come in, put another ubiquitin on it, another one, another one. So you get chains of this ubiquitin on the substrate. Um, that, subs that substrate then will be recognized by the proteasome, and there's a, there's a, um, a little animation I'll show you in a minute, where it's almost like the lid opens up like a garbage can. And the protein goes in, ubiquitins get stripped off, and then the protein comes out as peptides on the other side. So remember back in chapter nine, let me pull that up real quick. You are my folders. Oh, here it is. Just open up Google Slides. Not a fan of Google Slides, but stay clear. Come on, baby. If you go back to the winch mechanism, okay, remember this? beta trip cp this is an E3 ligase. So this is what we're talking about, an enzyme like this. So remember back here, we, we phosphorylated and then ubiquitinated beta-catenin 
and it got degraded by the degraded by the protozoa. So in the current case, our E3 ligase is called anaphase promoting complex APC. And that's what we're going to talk about next, APC. Because um, APC is going to, going to be key to breaking down cyclin B and getting the cell through that um, metaphase anaphase transition. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so now I'm going to answer some of the questions we got earlier. What's going on with this transition here? So when we activate uh, NPF, this is a kinase, and it's going to go out and number one, phosphorylate the nuclear lamins, and then depolymerize. It's also going, and then the whole nuclear membrane falls apart, becomes vesicles, and then it's going to phosphorylate condensin, and condensin is then going to cause condensation of the chromosomes, and it's going to activate non-motor maps, and that'll rearrange the cytoskeleton. So all the activities here of MPF are what's what are initiating prophase, mitotic spindle formation, chromosome condensation, and nuclear breakdown. The third thing it's going to do too is activate targeted protein degradation. So MPF is going, going to be important for the activation of APC. Okay, protein, targeted protein degradation of APC. And APC is going to get us through this metaphase anaphase transition and break down cyclin. All right, so let's look at that. That's another interesting and complex um, transition. So there's a lot of factors involved with this. I'd like to start out just talking about the factors and then we put them into a story to see how they work. So APC is a big complex, a lot of proteins involved here. Um, it's a ubiquitin ligase. An E3 ubiquitin ligase. Now, don't get confused with APC from the GSK3 beta pathway. Right? I have that up already. Oops. Right? One of these, pro here's APC here, right? That's a totally different protein. That's called APC because it's, um, it's uh, a demodus polyposis coli. It's, it's commonly mutated in, in colon cancer. This is totally different. This is anaphase promoting complex. Okay. So APC is activated by CDC20. Again, CDC. CDC is 20 is a protein that's bound to the kinetochore um, during prophase and is bound there by MAD and BUB proteins. So these are holding that CDC20 to the kinetochore until the kinetochore is attached to the microtubules. Then the MAD and BUB proteins let go. And that's the signal that everything's attached. Cohesins then, as I said earlier, are proteins that are binding those sister chromatids together. Separase is, going, is, a, is a protease that's going to break down these cohesins. And securase is a protein that binds to separase and inhibits it. So securase is inhibiting separase, which would break down the cohesins and allow the, the sister chromatids to separate. And this is all being triggered by MAD and BUB proteins that keep CDC20 on the kinetochore. So let's see how this works. All right. So unattached chromosomes, right? You've got MAD and BUB proteins here and CDC20. Once the, the spindle attaches to the chromosomes and everything's attached, the MAD and BUB proteins release CDC20. CDC20 then binds to um, APC and gets and APC gets activated. And APC then being ubiquitin ligase is going to ubiquitinate securin. Securin then gets degraded, releasing separase. Separase breaks down the cohesins and we get anaphase. Another part of this that isn't in this figure is that this anaphase pro promoting complex has to be phosphorylated by this down here, which is MP, uh, MPF. Okay, this is cyclin B, CDC2. And this is going to phosphorylate APC to, act, to fully activate it. APC then breaks down securin, allowing anaphase to happen. 
and it also ubiquitinates uh, cyclin B and so breaks down cyclin B and then causes the end of mitosis. Okay, isn't that neat? I think it's neat. MPF kind of um, it activates itself by uh, phosphorylating that phosphatase and it inactivates itself by phosphorylating ATC. It's like a computer program, it just plays out. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Because this is really complicated. I was hoping it's going to take more than an hour to talk about. <laughs> That's it, eh? No questions? All right. So I don't want to go too far today because we've got a lot more. We, I think we've covered a lot already. Um, so you know, usually, have, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, so when you were first showing the slides uh, to above this, it looked like the Matt and Bob were attacking the cohesions, but they're not, they're getting the CDC. So is CDC on, on the outside of the sister chromatid, or is no. this just more of like the depiction that they chose? And it's, it's just a depiction, really, just to get the idea across that they're holding it there. Um, I don't know exactly how CDC 20 and Mad and Bub are interacting with the Kinetochore, but it's all part of that complex. Yeah. I like it when people push me past what I know. I guess we should look into that. I'll try and find a figure on that one. Okay. Okay, so just to summarize what we talked about today, getting through this G2 transition involves activating your, or having cyclin B buildup, binding to CDC2, and then a series of phosphorylation, dephosphorylation events gets you through this. It then activates APC and APC breaks it down. So now the cyclone's still there, but it's off. And we're gonna see a similar thing here in our restriction point um, to get us through that restriction point. And again, all the way through this S phase and G2, we're gonna see different cyclones and CDKs getting together to force the cell forward in the, in the cell cycle. No questions, comments? All right, I don't really want to go any further today. Um, the next, in the next uh, class, we will let's see, stop sharing. Stop sharing so much, Doctor Session. Okay, so in the next class, we'll um, we'll do that next transition, and then we'll start talking about checks on DNA damage to see how the cell uh, makes sure that the DNA is okay as it goes through. And then we'll go on to apoptosis and what happens when, you know, the DNA damage can't be fixed. Okay. All right. Well, let's call it a day. And hopefully we can meet you all again here on Thursday. No, Wednesday. You guys have tomorrow off? Tomorrow day off?